All right, so why should you care about Scala? Uh, sort of to summarize it, this is me programming in Java, and this is me programming in Scala. Um, a little more specifically, we, when we switch to Scala, for example, we would sometimes do proof of concept, uh, proof of concept development code for integrating to a certain repository. Uh, data source. Um, and generally, it might take us a month to develop that, that prototype. When we switch to Scala, we cut that down to a week. So out of that, you get much faster development. Um, rapid evolution. So what I'm talking about there is Scala actually can evolve a little bit faster than the JDM. Uh, we're currently running on, uh, we're actually running on Java 7, but Scala is backwards compatible with Java 5. And if you're excited about things like Java 8 collections, Scala already has that. Um, additionally, it's easier to write DSLs. If you've seen uh, specifications in Ruby, you know how they're very <coughs> sentence-like and um, one of the cool things that Scala allows you to do is write much cleaner DSLs. So they have the ability to omit the parens when you're calling a, a, void, a function that takes no parameters. So you just see the method name. And that cleans up some of your, some of your code when you're writing tests, uh, making that a lot easier to, to go through. Um, their type system is a bit more robust than what Java gives you, even though it's built on top of Java, or it runs on JVM eventually. Uh, the type system gives you great covariance, contravariance, uh, views, and all sorts of crazy stuff that you can get into, but sometimes it's way over my head. Um, but again, it's there. It helps you with uh, with type safety and creating classes that are a little bit uh, less annoying to deal with the types because you declare them at the time when you declare your method or your uh, or your class, not at the not when you call them. Um, and lastly, one of the really cool things that Scala gives you is the ability to enrich classes. Um, this is formerly known as pimping libraries. Um, they've switched over to a, a little bit more politically correct term. Um, and that's, that's what I'll go over a little bit later. So if you're asking yourself, should I use Java for this? The answer is yes. Wait, no, the answer is Scala. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you're using Java, um, you should, you, you can, and you should use Scala. It's it's easy to switch. Um, it generally uh, plugs right into your existing build systems. Uh, if you're using Maven, it's it's really easy to simply pull it in. It's a dependency, um, and compiles down to bytecode, so it runs on your your existing environment. Um, I'll go into sort of the some of the basics of Scala and sort of show you why it's maybe so cool. Um, and we'll go through some baby steps. Uh, sort of a story. In Java, you might create this this class called Coffee, and uh, you know you have a, a nice little member variable. It's it's the flavor and it's a little bland, and you have a, a single method that says whether or not it's Java, and it returns true in this case. That's not all that interesting. Because, well, we can't really get to flavor. So let's add an accessor. All right, yeah, we got flavor there. So we have an accessor for our, for our member variable. Um, can anybody spot the error here? Semicolon. semicolon. Oh yes, those terrible semicolons. Um, 
so anyway, we want to uh, we want to maybe be able to set our member variable. All right, we have to we have to add a constructor that takes in uh, takes in flavor and then sets flavor, and then, all right, we're good now. And uh, oh, we we also need a default constructor because we want flavor to be set to land. All right, all right, we're good, we're good. And uh, oh. Oh, what are we missing now? Anybody? Two string. <clears throat> Two string equals hash code. All right. Okay. That all of that same class in Scala. <laughs> Java Scala. Java Scala. <laughs> um, so I'll sort of explain a little bit about what's going on here. Um, one of the cool things, Scala has default, uh, default values for parameters in its methods and constructors. Um, you also don't need semicolons. You can if you want, but why, why type the extra character? Um, additionally, this is the constructor. Um, and since this is a case class, it automatically generates the equals, two string, and hash code methods for all of its member variables, which we specified right there in the constructor. So, for all your mem member variables, always in the constructor. That's where you for a case class. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you can for other. I mean, you could define extra extra constructors that eventually call up to the, uh, the main constructor. Yeah. So same thing like a job. Java, Scala, Scala, Scala. All right. Um, so that's one of the really, really helpful things that we've saved lots of time on. Because, uh, hey, I want to add a member variable to this, to this case class. <coughs> oh, shoot. I forgot to update the hash code method. You now have a bug in your program. Don't have to worry about it. Um, that's case classes. Some of the other cool things in Java 8 are their collections and uh, function literals. So you might want to create a list of fruits. And we have a new apple, orange, and pear. And for each one of those fruits, we want to apply this noms function. All right, we're going to noms each of the fruits. Um, and then after we do that, we also want to apply a filter for any fruit that has pulp. And then we're going to take that, we're going to take those fruits and we're going to turn them into new juice. And then each one of those juices we're going to uh, drink. All right, that's that's pretty cool. And in Java 8, you can you can write very understandable code like that. You can also do that in Scala. Java, Scala. So, um, except you can do that in Java 5 with Scala, which is really awesome because if you're dealing with a product that you're shipping that can't update their JVM until two years from now, you can start using this right now. So you get all of those really cool collection features today. Um, abbreviating the syntax a little bit, we can actually do things a little bit shorter. Scala, uh, where you can use underscores for placeholders and things like that, uh, similar to uh, PowerShell. And this is a little bit more idiomatically Scala. So these are referred to as the cons <coughs> operator for creating lists. Uh, what you see here is actually called a for comprehension. And those are really helpful for uh, combining
combining things like filter and map and for each. So what we have here is we're taking all of our fruits and we're only taking the fruits that have pulp and then we are mapping them to juice and then for each one of those things we're drinking. And again, you'll notice the spacing because uh, Scala can actually, here we omit the parens, uh, but Scala can also omit the dot in many cases. So you have very clean code when you, uh, when you look at it. You can sometimes read it like a sentence. Okay. So, can I ask a question? Sure. What's the nil at the end of the array on the first line? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the end of the list. Okay. So, what okay. happens actually is the, the cons operator is a left associative, I think, or right associative, whatever. Um, and it is tied to the nil, mm -hmm. because nil is a, a child of list. And so, that cons operator belongs to nil, and then the result of, it, it takes in an object and produces a list, and so then that gets applied, or you know, this gets called on that, um, and then back up the chain. So if you reach over that, does it go in reverse order? Yeah. The no, it doesn't actually. Okay. It, it still goes in apple to orange. Okay. Um, okay. So that was some, some basics on iterating over sequences and, and collections. Uh, another really cool thing is implicits. And as I mentioned earlier, enriching libraries. Uh, just a big warning here. <coughs> here there be dragons. Um, implicits can be, can be dangerous if you are not careful. So let's say we have a method called pet D, and it takes a dragon, um, and then it does something and it returns a unit. Unit is kind of like void in Java, uh, except it's a little bit different, but we won't go into that. Um, just think of it like void. Also, if you notice, you can have method names with spaces. What? Um, <laughs> that's that's a stylistic thing. You don't necessarily want to go down that path if, if you don't have to. But I figured I'd show you the cool uh, little cool little feature of uh, Scala. So let's say we have a method. By the way, def is how you create a method in Scala uh, called pet d, and it takes a dragon. Except in my tests, I don't want to write pet b and then in parens write new Komodo dragon to, to create a new Komodo dragon or whatever. Um, I just want to, to use the string. But pet b doesn't take a string, it takes yes. a dragon. So what we can do is we can use an implicit that converts a string to a dragon. And so we implicitly change this string to a new Komodo dragon, or if I had typed bearded, it would create a new bearded dragon. So it automatically says, you gave me a string, this method takes a dragon, let me switch the, uh, let me run it through this method and get a dragon for you. Um, you also have really cool things around case uh, cases, uh, match, matching and, and case statements. Uh, and the other thing I didn't mention, this is actually an operator in Scala, uh, Scala 2.10. The question mark, question mark, question mark is uh, the not implemented operator <laughs> or, or method. And what that does is it, when it runs, it actually throws an exception and says, hey, you're missing an implementation here. Uh, it's great for Right, uh, starting out with tests or uh, mocking, mocking objects, um, just keeping a placeholder where you, where you need one. So this code would actually compile. 
if I get a question. No, okay. I just scratch my head and smile. <laughs> um, so one of the other things that you can do with implicits uh, is to enrich classes. So our dragon class does not have a method called fly. If you tried doing this, you would get a compiler error. However, we can define an implicit class called rich dragon. The convention is to call an enhanced type rich and then the, the class name. And what it does is it takes a dragon and it defines a method called fly. So we have, we can then call my Komodo dragon dot fly, and it actually compiles and runs just fine. So you can use this to do things like enhance APIs or libraries. Uh, that's probably the best application that, that we've come across for uh, for enriching types. It's very similar to monkey patching and Ruby. It is, but it's much safer because it all happens at compile time and you don't namespacing also or uh, you, you're not actually modifying the, the class itself because uh, this will happen through uh, either a static method or an actual class that uh, an actual instance of class so you're not modifying the, the class that you're not monkey, in monkey patching. You're actually modifying the class. Here, you're you're doing it safely. You can't really step on toes. So yeah, we've added the fly function to our dragon class. <laughs> MS Paint. Yeah. Is it MS Paint? Yeah, <laughs> close. Actually, no. Yeah, it was no, it was Gimp. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're advanced. Oh, too far. Um, again, a word of, war word of warning, implicits can do things like obscuring your code because you look at this method and you say, this method takes a dragon, it shouldn't take a string, why does this work? And you know, you have, you have some obscurity there. Uh, and we, we generally try to, to minimize our use of implicits. Um, so, beware. This is another example of really awesome Scala code. It's called Spark, which is an Apache project that is built on top of Hadoop. And this is the entirety of a word count MapReduce job. If you've ever written um, MapReduce jobs in Java, you will love this because that goes from I don't even know how many lines of code to, to three. Um, it's wonderful. And it looks very much like what you would normally write in Scala. You have a map function, you have, uh, you have flat map, that's a, also a standard, uh, a standard function to apply in Scala. And reduce by key is, is really uh, similar to like a fold left or a fold right operation. Uh, so that was sort of an overview of some of the really cool things you can do with, with Scala. Um, where do you go from here? How do, how do you start using it? Uh, what, we, what I would recommend is to start using it in your tests, not necessarily in your production code. Uh, it's maybe a, a little bit safer of, a, of a, an approach because you're not going to be you're not going to be shipping your tests you can get used to writing things in Scala and then eventually transition it, transition it into your into your uh, production code um, a good starting point is to start using it like a better Java so replace all of your all of your data classes or your, your data holding classes with case classes. Um, instead of writing you know, loops that 
um, convert one collection of objects into another collect a collection of different objects, you can write maps, uh, you know, apply a map function, things like that. Um, and just get rid of all the semicolons. And eventually, after you get comfortable with using it as a better Java, you can start doing things like functional programming, which is almost a, a whole other thing in and of itself. Um, I do recommend using IntelliJ. I don't recommend using Eclipse at the moment. Um, the Scala plugin is, it's just better than intelligent. Save yourself the headaches, go with that. Um, use Maven, don't use SVT. Sorry, Josh. Um, Josh Sareft is actually one of the members of the Pittsburgh uh, Scala users group. He's also an employee of TypeSafe which is the company that produces Scala, and he wrote SBT, uh, or maintains it. So, but I do recommend using Maven over SBT right now, just because it's less heavy. Um, I also recommend buying Josh's book. It's called Scala in Depth. It looks like this. I don't know why there's a dude in tights on the front, but there is. So you know what it looks like. Um, it's sort of the it's sort of the the epitome of Scala Scala books. It, if you want to get started, that's where to start. Um, other than that, we also have the Scala Meetup group in Pittsburgh. Check it out. And I also do recommend the functional programming course in Coursera. It's, it's a great place to, to start experimenting with Scala and also learning what functional programming is, is all about. Um, you might not necessarily use all of, the, all of the things you learn in that class right away, but it's, it's good to, to start thinking in a more functional uh, mindset. And that's all I got. Would you say a lot of those functions you were looking at, like the map and even filter, sort of the functional programming, the functional programming construct built into the language? Yeah. Right. And yeah. It's it. Like those are those are sort of uh, very basic functional mm -hmm. concepts, um, and and they're really easy to wrap your head around. So, like. You can you can integrate those into your object oriented code very easily uh, without like doing everything as functional programming. Right. Yeah. So I have a question which kind of asked me to ask at the end, but um, it, it's a little bit more complex than the original question. So you kind of alluded to it um, when you said start writing Scala with your text, mm -hmm. and uh, even earlier in the conversation. But basically. You're using Scala, it's working alongside of your Java code. You can pull in your Java, existing Java libraries, existing Java frameworks, and use it within the Scala framework, and presumably vice versa. Yeah, so uh, one, of the, one of the great things is the ability to interoperate between Scala and Java. Uh, when we wanted to start writing things in Scala, uh, you know, one of the questions is, oh, well, does that mean that we're going to have to start shipping this, this new environment to be able to run the applications? And the answer is, is no. All it is is an extra dependency, an extra library that we ship with our, with our code, with our jar. That brings the second question, though. That's really exactly to that. So it's what's compiling all the code together? Um, is it the Scala compiler and the Java C compiler, or is it the Java C compiler pulling the Scala library? It's, it's the Scala C, uh, Scala compiler. Okay. So the, the Scala compiler takes the Scala code and turns it into bytecode. Okay. What about all the other Java code? Is that a separate um, build? So the Scala compiler can, I believe it can compile the Java code, um, or you can have the Java compiler yeah. compile it. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Yep. Um, on interoperability, uh, 
you can use Scala libraries built in Scala from Java. There are some, some guidelines around doing that so that you don't try and use a, a tuple in, or you don't have to create a tuple from Java, which can sometimes be a, a bit of a pain, and things like that. Um, or like a, a function object, you know, you, you have to, you want to call this this method, and it takes a, a function to, and from Java you're like, what is that? But from Scala it'd just be your your simple syntax. You wouldn't even notice that you're using a function to. Um, so there are there are some guidelines like defining your API in Java so that you don't accidentally expose Scala. Um, if it's going, if you're assuming that your API is going to be used from Java, if your use case is, hey, we're developing this library for Scala, uh, for Scala developers, then well, who cares? Um, so if you're writing libraries in Scala for Java, there are some things that you have to consider. But if you are using, or if you have a Java library that you want to use from Scala, it's transparent. You just call the methods. So. Okay. I have a question on the slide uh, where you showed the implicit uh, type conversion. Mm -hmm. Is there something um, that's not shown there that tells, that indicates that it should use that type conversion, or um, it, you know, it said str to dragon or something like that. So, yes. or is that where the implicitness comes in? Like it here? Yeah. Um, so implicits have, they have very defined uh, rules for their scoping and their resolution. Um, so basically it comes down to scoping. Okay. Uh, if, what it would do here is it would like look within the, the, current, the current class to see if there's been an implicit defined that, that Goes from string to uh, string to dragon, and then it would um, it would then go to like the, the package object, and then above that it would go to like the string object. I think it's either the string or the dragon object to see if there's a, if there's an implicit defined there. Um, so because of those rules, you can again get yourself into some sticky situations where you're like. Where is this coming from? Um, and so we, we tend to try and limit the scope of our implicits as much as as much as possible. About perform performance, how does it compare against Java? Um, we haven't noticed any. any no, it's not noticed to be faster or slower. I I can't say for certain. I, I, my inclination is to say that it's that it's faster, um, but that's not the reason why you're using it. No, I mean, the, the reason really the reason that we're using it is uh, to get rid of a lot of the boilerplate of, of Java to be able to, to when we need to be able to use functional programming. Um, just yeah, I mean realistically we were, we were tired of writing things in Java, and it's. It's also type safe, so uh, if you are dealing, you know, we also looked at things like Haskell and Clojure as alternatives, and one of the things that attracted us to Scala was the fact that it is type safe. So you have type checking at compile time to say, hey, this is a string, not a, not a dragon. One of the one of the big um, gains that we've noticed is that during during the development cycle, it's pretty easy to um, substitute in parallel versions of some of the operations. That if you know that if you know that the function that you're passing into a map or something is is thread safe, then um, it's if it's more, like four extra characters to turn it into a parallel method. No other no other thought required. So you get, a, you get a performance gain there. Whereas to do the same thing in Java will take a lot more code. So it's the development? Performance in the development time as opposed to performance in the actual running of the thing. Yeah. 
I think there's, there's... I understand what you're saying. It seems like what you're really doing is it's because it's easier to code and it, it's not because it's, it's faster or, or better. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it all... It's yeah, easier to write code. Than it all compiles down to, to byte code and the a lot of it gets code. optimized one way or another. You know, so it's... Uh, yeah, right. It, it's efficient. Nice. Kind of like not not so technical, but just more of like a general history of Scala. Like, how old is Scala, and when did you guys start actually implementing it? Like, just curious of how you know when did it start becoming an idea? And um, so we started. I think the first product that we shipped that had it was the beginning of last year, so the beginning of 2013, um, and that was the the first like IBM product release that. Had Scala in it. Um, that was our group. Gotcha. Yeah. And it was it a few years that it had been in development um, before so that? So Scala or? has been around for, for I want to say since 2005, something like that. Um, it was originally created by Martin Odersky, who was one of the creators of the uh, Java compiler for like Java. I think it was, um, with you know generics and, and all of those things that made life in Java a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, but he wanted to take it even further, and so he decided to go off on his own and, and create the Scala one. Cool. Awesome. Anybody else have any questions? Cool. All right, Matt. Thank you.